Welcome to this program. It's uh, number 16, if you're following the series. Um, and the, the main title is God's Amazing Love. Um, and in, in these programs, uh, last time and the next two, we're looking at the way in which uh, the unexpected, the sudden events occur. Uh, and sometimes we can be shaken by them. But God, who loves us so much, has a good purpose. And that's going to be the theme again today uh, and in the, the next meeting, uh, next program, as it was in the last one. So a warm welcome to you, uh, wherever you are. And if you're in a care home, uh, a special welcome. And uh, if you're struggling or wanting to know more, then details will be given at the end. So a very warm welcome to you. And uh, Fiona, uh, who is... Um, a ladies pastoral work in the Heath Church in Cardiff. Um, she is going to um, lead the program now. Let's just begin now in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are so worthy of our praise. And uh, Lord, we just come now, open our eyes, give us hearts and lips to praise you. And Lord, especially show us more of your amazing love for us in sending your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we are so thankful for your love to us even though none of us deserve it. Lord, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for 
loving us not because we're worthy but because you set your love upon us in eternity in jesus name amen and now uh, megan conway is going to, to read the bible for us okay um our reading is from uh, philippians chapter one verses one to six Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy uh, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We are thinking about God's love, which is amazing. And yet in our lives, problems arise unexpectedly and suddenly. And yet God is working out a purpose, which is good. And sometimes through problems, God brings some individuals to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen that that happened to Lydia in Philippi, who was a member in the church that Paul is writing to in this letter. But there were other people whose lives were changed unexpectedly. We're introduced to a young woman. We don't know her age or her name. Some think that she was in her late teens or early 20s. She was a slave. She was owned by a group of business people, and they made money through her fortune telling. And the Bible says that she had an evil spirit or a, a python spirit, and this spirit enabled her to try and guess and forecast the future. And people paid money just to listen to what she said. And surprisingly, this young woman recognized Paul and his companions. And so she started following them as they walked around the city of Philippi. And uh, as she followed, she began to shout out after them. These men, she said, are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. She recognized that Paul and his companions were God's servants telling people how they could be right with God. And this happened day after day after day for many weeks. And Paul did nothing about it. Perhaps Paul thought that she was advertising the Christian faith. But one day, the Apostle Paul turned around and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. He was commanding the, the evil spirit, the demon, inside this young woman to come out. And he did so in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And immediately she was delivered. She was normal. Unexpectedly, she was different. Now, clearly she had dabbled in the world of the occult. It's a very dark, dirty, dangerous world. And people don't realize how dangerous it is. And I've been in situations where sometimes witchcraft or witches or people using other forms of the occult have been in great difficulties and darkness and even physically attacked. But of Jesus Christ, he gives the victory. And it's exciting that the Lord Jesus who died on the cross defeated sin and the devil and his resurrection means that he rules, he governs and he can deliver from any evil force and protect his people. Well, Jesus is Lord. That was Paul's message. However, there was trouble because the owners of this young woman, the business people, were angry because they could no longer use her in her business and, and get money from her. And so they complained to the police and the magistrates. 
Paul and Silas were thrown into prison, and not just into prison, but into the lowest parts of the prison in the dungeon, and their feet were, were, were fixed in, in, in wooden stocks. And that's the story. Well, it's not the end of the story because something unexpected happened. It was a complete surprise to lots of people. Because we're told that at midnight, Paul and Silas in prison, they were praying, they were singing hymns, and the prisoners were listening to them. They had nothing else to do. There's no television, no radio, no mobile phones. So they were glad to listen to what Paul and Silas were singing and praying and perhaps preaching too. Then we're told about a jailer in the prison in Philippi. Just think of him, he's in charge of the prison. There are lots of people there in, in jail. We don't know his name. We don't know his background. But just imagine him having breakfast that morning. Uh, thinking, oh, well, I'm having my cornflakes or my porridge or my egg and bacon. And uh, what's going to happen in work today? Oh, I, I need to, to see so-and-so and I need to make sure the doors are safe. Well, he was a family man. We know that. He had servants working uh, for him in the home as well. But Paul and Silas had been thrown into the prison by the magistrates because the business people were very angry. They'd lost their business because the, the young girl had been delivered from an evil spirit. And they'd been placed in the dungeon and their feet in wooden stocks. And at midnight, we're told that Paul and Silas were singing hymns and they were praying to God. And all the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly at midnight, a great earthquake occurred. The foundations were shaking. We're not told for how long the walls, the doors were shaken. In fact, the, the doors actually opened and the wooden stocks which held the feet of Paul and Silas were, were opened as well. It was quite remarkable, quite unexpected. And some of the prisoners were beginning to leave and Paul and Silas began to walk out of their dungeon. And when the jailer saw them, he said, well, I'll have to kill myself because he'd been warned not to allow Paul and Silas to escape. They were important prisoners. So he was about to kill himself. And Paul said, don't do that. Don't hurt yourself. We're all here. Then the jailer asked a very important question. Perhaps he'd never asked it before. Sir, what must I do to be saved? How can I become a Christian? Paul and Silas immediately told them, and there's only one answer to give, believe. It's not what you do, it's not what we are, but we have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came into the world from heaven, the one who lived perfectly, the one who died on the cross for the punishment of my sin, who rose from the dead. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll be saved, you'll be right with God. You will have forgiveness. And your family, your household too. And the jailer became a Christian uh, immediately. And, and he took Paul and Silas back to his home and uh, washed the wounds where he'd been beaten. And uh, his wife made supper for them. And Paul preached about Jesus Christ to his wife, to the children, to the servants. And the family became Christians, and there was a baptism later. It was all unexpected. The jailer, his wife, children and, and, and servants, they never imagined that through that earthquake, God would work out his purpose for good in their lives, and they would become Christians. Well, I don't know what your circumstances. You may be struggling. The unexpected has happened. You've had bad news. You, you're wondering, well, does God really love me? Well, the Bible says that God loves us and he's in charge of the world. 
Though he doesn't make people sin, yet he cares, he loves, and he wants to do good in our lives, and he wants us to know his love. So I mentioned the widow of the police sergeant. Well, the story develops because in her depression, her sadness and darkness, she began to see that God was speaking to her. I'll tell you more again. But remember, God's love is amazing, though we don't understand what's happening. Amen. Our next hymn is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, Pilgrim Through This Barren Land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. So let's sing, guide me, O thou great Jehovah. going to um, have an interview with Megan Conway who did the reading earlier and she is a student worker with UCCF in Swansea. Hi Megan. Hello, nice to be here, thanks Great for having me. Have you here. <laughs> um, so I just want to ask you a few questions about your life. Um, can you just start by telling us where are you from and how did you become a Christian? Yeah, great. Um, so I'm from North Wales, a town called Flint. Um, it's a lovely, lovely town. Um, and I grew up going to church. So I grew up going to the little, the local evangelical church where my tide was the pastor of the church. So I was always taught um, about God and his love for us and his kindness in sending Jesus to come and to die on the cross for sinners. So um uh, eventually, at the age of, I think I was 13, I um, decided that it was about time I accepted this to be true for myself, and uh, and I prayed and accepted Jesus to be my saviour. So that was when I was about 13, I think. Okay, thank you. And was this very unexpected when you became a Christian? Do you know, 
For me, I don't think I was, I wasn't surprised, I don't think. I'm not sure about my family. I suppose when you're a family of someone, um, of a, a child in a church, you really hope that they'll one day accept uh, Jesus to be their own saviour. Um, for me, I'm not, I wasn't surprised. Do you know, I don't remember a time where I ever doubted what I was taught um, about who God was and his love. So I never doubted it. So I think at the age of 13, um, the Lord prompted me um, to make a decision about it, I suppose. It was one of those times I remember lying on um, my sister's bed. We had a bunk bed. And I remember lying at nighttime and looking out the window and just talking to the Lord and um, sort of feeling the challenge. Meg, what are you going to do about this? If you believe it to be true, um, why don't you, you know, commit your life to following me now? So I did it. So I wasn't surprised really, because I always believed it was true anyway. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we've heard about how Paul was used to bring people to Christ, to believe in Christ. Uh, was there anyone particular in your life who helped you to believe? Yeah. Um, do you know, there are, there are so many people actually that I could pinpoint, I suppose, who were massive influences in teaching me faithfully things of the Bible, whether it's tied from the pulpit and then his lifestyle outside of church backing up what he preached, I suppose. Um, you know, my big sister became a Christian, I think a few years before me. Uh, so she was an example. Um, other family members, you know, Sunday school teachers. However, the day I actually became a Christian, there was a girl who had, she was from a church in Llandidno and she had become a Christian from extraordinary means because she didn't have any Christian family. Um, and because she was the only young person in a church, she'd been invited to come and join our youth meeting in our church in Flint. So she comes over and she was going to be on camp with me a, a few weeks time in the summer. We used to go on summer camps to Brynna Groys in Bala. And um, my mum was a youth leader. So mum called me over and said, Meg, this is Claire. She's going to be on camp with you in a few weeks time. You know, go and play and introduce her to your friends and things. So I did. We went and I introduced her to the rest of the, the gang. And um, the talk was about to begin in our youth meeting. And um, we were all sitting down. And just before the events that the meeting started, Claire turned to me and said, oh, so we're going to be on camp together in a few weeks. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't wait. It's going to be so good. And she said, um, yeah, I'm excited as well. So you're a Christian then. And, you know, as a, as a child growing up in the church, I always found it super embarrassing being asked if I was a Christian when I knew that I wasn't because I was supposed to be a Christian. I, I grew up, I went to church. Um, so I remember I usually would just shrug it off and say, yeah, 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 of course I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this time, for the first time I remember, I actually just said, oh, no, I'm not actually. And the Lord used this interaction because she then said to me, um, oh, then why are you going on a Christian camp then? Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that just challenged me and uh, the Lord used it to have me think over the next how many hours um, or even days actually. And then eventually I, uh, I sort of dealt with it myself on my sister's bunk bed, uh, praying to the Lord. And, and so it wasn't sort of like Paul intentionally preaching the gospel to me. It was Claire asking me a question innocently wondering why I would want to go on this camp if I wasn't a Christian and uh, that was definitely how the Lord nudged me to make a commitment I think. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so you became a Christian age 13 and did you notice your life changing a lot after that? Do you know no nothing drastic I think I'd always you know tried to be well behaved like uh, the bible would tell me or um uh, i would try to you know i tried reading the bible and praying and things like that so i suppose the only the most drastic change was my intentional desire to pursue more prayer and more bible reading i suppose um but because a lot of habits were the same i continued going to school i knew that this, at this point as a christian i needed to be able to defend my faith a little more if anyone in school gave me a scrap about it um but I, there was nothing drastic nothing dramatic change the change came a few years later when i got to university and there was a real challenge um of um, Megan, whose faith is this? Is this your faith or is it your tides faith back home in Flint or is it your family's? So I think that's when the real changes started to come. But when I was 13, there was nothing drastic um, apart from my 
new, I suppose, intentional pursuits of spending time with God, I guess. And could you just explain briefly some of the changes when you were a student then? What sort of things? Yeah, wow. University experience is so fun for a Christian. I remember really thinking before going in September, I was preparing mentally. Okay, how am I going to make a stand? How am I going to let people know that I'm a Christian? Um, uh, will it be through not living in the same way as them? Will it be through my conversation? Will I tell them that I'm a, what was I going to do? Um, so there was that. And I suppose after learning that actually I do believe this for myself it's not just what was preached at home and it's not just my family's faith I do believe it it is my own um I suppose a whole new world of wanting to learn and grow and study and um you know have deeper knowledge have better answer to questions when friends would ask um so oh yeah a whole new um, world was opened when I got to university for my faith Amazing. Thank you for sharing that too. Is there a particular Bible verse that has been really important to you in your Christian life? Do you know, over time, I think I've had lots of different verses that I've tried to make sort of like a slogan for life. But every single time I'm asked a question like this, I always come back to the same passage, not verse actually. And I think Ephesians chapter one is probably, Ephesians I think at this point is still my favourite book in the Bible. Um, but chapter one, especially, um, because it just, it lists the spiritual blessings we, we receive in Christ as believers, um, things of being, you know, being adopted as sons and daughters of the King, um, you know, being forgiven from sins by the blood of Jesus. It just goes on. It's such a rich list of um, things that we are given in Christ. Um, so that is my go-to passage at all times. And especially in talking to um, maybe discouraged believers or even people who actually don't know Jesus yet. This is always a passage I'll come to and say, well, this is what a Christian is. This is what a Christian receives and is given and, and is called to. Um, so it's a definite, wonderful passage to go to. I encourage uh, anyone watching to have a look, Ephesians chapter one. And there's a wonderful prayer as well to end the chapter. So definitely Ephesians one. Brilliant. Thank you, Megan. We'll be hearing from Megan again in the next episode. So um, make sure you watch that too. Uh, we're going to sing uh, again the hymn, How Good is the God We Adore, because that's what we've been talking about today. God is good all the time, even in the, the difficult um, and surprising providences, the good and the bad. He is always good. And I'll just read the second verse this time. Tis Jesus, the first and the last, whose spirit shall guide us safe home. We'll praise him for all that is past and trust him for all that's to come. Let's sing, how good is the God we adore. thank you that you are so good uh, thank you that all your ways are are good and we know that um, is true as we look at what you did for us in sending your son to die for us Lord you did not spare your only son but gave him up for us all and Lord help us to trust you and help us to trust especially in those surprising providences uh, knowing that you are always at work and you're always working your per perfect purposes out in our lives. And Lord, we just thank you that we're able to 
read about Lydia and the, the jailer and his family. And uh, thank you for what Megan has shared. And we pray that each one of us would know what it is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. In his name we pray. Amen. If you want to ask questions about something we have said or about how to become a Christian, or if you have a problem to share, then you are very welcome to contact Dr. Davis via email at office at heath-church.org or write to Heath Church, 122 Whitchurch Road, Heath, Cardiff, CF 143LZ. Remember that God's love is amazing.